Hey, and welcome to worship at Northwest Online. We're so excited that you've joined us today. God's going to do some amazing things through our service today. A um, couple things I want to tell you about before we dive into the music. Well, you're going to need a Bible today. We're going to be in Jonah chapter 2, and so you're going to need a Bible. Whether you choose to do a physical Bible like I do, or if you want to do an online Bible, you want to grab your phone and follow along with us, anyway is great, but you're going to need that today. So make sure you get a Bible. Uh, we're going to be, again, in Jonah chapter 2 as we continue our series called Prodigal Prophet. So that's coming up here in just a little bit. We're going to sing some today as well. Many of you, you're old hats at this. You're practice at this. You know how this works. You're used to my spiel, but I just want to remind you, as we sing, sing out. Sing out. Lift your voices in song. It's a crucial part of our worship together for you to sing along with us. The words are going to be on the screen. Uh, so really encourage you to do that. Even if it feels a little awkward, even if singing's not your thing, guess what? You're online. Nobody's going to hear you. So you're okay. Uh, so please do that with us today. Make sure you sing. Um, we're going to take communion at the end. We always take communion every single Sunday, every single time we gather together, every single week at Northwest as part of our pattern of worship. That's something we see in Scripture. And so we are even doing that as we worship online. So if you need to get some, some elements, you need to get something for the bread, something for the juice, I encourage you to go do that right now so that you're ready for that at the end of our service together. We're going to take communion then. You can also give online as well. So God's been so faithful. He's used you. You've been so generous. We really appreciate that. July's been a little bit tight for us, um, but that's okay. God moves even through that. That's something we're going to talk about today is how God moves in the challenges. Uh, but if you're an online giver, we encourage you, nwcc.net slash give. You can go online right now from your phone or from wherever, and you can give online. I encourage you to automate your giving. That's even better. It's, it's easier. It's something and that way you don't ever forget about it. It's just part of our, our, our pattern here at Northwest. So you can do that, nwcc.net slash give. Now I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to dive right into some music together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray for a special blessing today. God, I pray that you will move today. God, I pray that you will just challenge everybody who's watching right now. God, that you will encourage everyone who's watching right now. God, that you will speak in major ways. You'll speak in new ways. You'll speak in powerful ways. God, that, that, that you will show up in, in all of our lives today in, in just ways that only you can. So we can't chalk it up to anything else. We can't chalk it up to circumstances or or life situations or anything we know that it's you and you alone and god i pray that you'll do that today inhabit the praises of your people as we sing help us to lift our voices and encouragement god speak to us through your word today we love you so much in jesus name i pray amen
All right, before we open up the Bible together, let's pray, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that you will speak to us through your word now. Lord, as we gather around your scripture, as we gather around the Bible, God, would you speak into us? Would you help us to understand the things that we don't understand? God, would you show us things that maybe we've never seen before? Help us to see it in a new way, from a new perspective. Help us to, to really hear your voice come through the words on the page. God, this isn't just some old textbook or some dusty pages from, from something written a couple thousand years ago. God, this is living and active. This is your word spoken to us. Help us to see it and hear it and understand it. And God, may we change and move and grow and shift our thinking and, our, and the way we live based on your word and yours alone. We love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I love this book. This book that we call the Bible, I love it. I, I, I talk about it all the time. You, you know how much, uh, how passionate I am about this book called the Bible. And I try to get into the word every single day. I try to read every single day, at least a chapter or two. I try to read as much as I can every single day, every single morning. Now, I'm like everybody else too, though. There are times where I forget. There are times where I get busy. There are times where I just wake up and I just, I, I don't have time. It's, it's life. I understand that. And maybe you're in the same boat as me. But I try to be in this book as much as possible because I just love the Bible. And, and people sometimes, they'll ask me, they're like, man, Jay, like, I get that the Bible's good. I, I mean, I get that it's God's word and, and, and it's, it's wonderful and everything. But how can you read the same things over and over and over again? I mean, how many times can you read the book of Matthew, right? Or how many times can you read Galatians or Ephesians? Like, wh why so much? Why every day? Like, I just don't understand. And to be honest, I used to be there. I, I get that. I, I used to be in that place. And, and then I remember this conversation I was having with one of my professors. It was one of my professors who was, he was one of my spiritual mentors. And, and in fact, he just passed away not too long ago. Uh, he was an amazing, incredible guy, incredible man of the Lord. And, and, and he used to say this in his classes. He used to say this to me. He used to say this to other people. Um, he'd quote this passage of scripture from the book of, Je book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. And this is what it says. It says, But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. And he would talk about this passage of scripture and he would say, listen, the Bible is it's this word inside of us and it's supposed to be this fire that wells up inside of our, our bones. We can't keep it anymore. It just kind of flows out from us. And then he said this, and, and I love this analogy. And, and I go back to this all the time when I get in that place where I'm like, man, do I, do I really need to read every single day? He said, you know, when, when you're building a fire, when you start that fire, um, if you don't feed the fire, if you don't keep throwing logs on the fire, if you don't keep adding more charcoal, whatever, 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 if you don't keep feeding that fire, the fire is going gonna, is gonna to go out. You can't just build it one time and expect it to continue. You have to add fuel to that fire. And he said, and sometimes if you're, if you're building your fire right, if you're really you know, in the word every day and you're adding those logs in the fire, sometimes the Holy Spirit will come along and he'll throw some lighter fluid on it and it'll just burst into this huge flame. He said, but... You got to have the logs there. You got to have the, the fire going. Otherwise, that, that, that spiritual lighter fluid, it doesn't do any good. And God does this all the time for me. I don't know, maybe, I don't know if he does this for you. Hopefully, he's done this for you in the past, where sometimes things will come along and it's just like that, that shot of uh, lighter fluid and it just bursts and the flame's already going, but it just explodes and it's just this amazing experience where the, the text just comes alive to you in a whole new way. I hope you've experienced that before. I had an experience just like that a couple days ago. A couple days ago. And, and uh, there's this passage of scripture I want to read to you from Lamentations chapter 3. From the book of Lamentations chapter 3. And this is what it says. And this, again, it was just kind of that moment for me. Uh, it was just this incredible moment. Lamentations chapter 3 starting at verse 21 says this, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And now I'd read that passage before. I'd read that passage a lot because again, I'm in the word every day, or at least I try to be. I've read Lamentations, and I've read that verse, and this is one that, I mean, it's a good verse, right? This is one you're probably going to find on a coffee cup somewhere, probably on a, on a, a you know, barnwood plaque at Hobby Lobby. Like, I mean, it's good stuff. But 
up until a couple days ago, it never really grabbed me. It ne- never grabbed my heart. It was, you know, it was a log on the fire. But, but up until a couple days ago, um, it, it had just never burst into flame in, in that special way. But then something happened in my life. My youngest, my daughter, Elizabeth, was born just a few days ago. And I, I got to tell you, the birth of Elizabeth was a challenge. Like, I, and I know I'm probably going to get nasty emails from moms. Like, every birth is hard. Every birth is tough. I get that. I'm not trying to minimize that. But for me and for my wife and for my family, this one was different. Um, this one was more difficult than any of the other, the other experiences we'd had in childbirth. Um, my other three kids were all big. Like my smallest up until just a couple of days ago was nine pounds, two ounces. And my wife, she does all natural. She doesn't do epidural. She doesn't do any drugs. She doesn't do anything. She's all natural. Like, and so she's birthed three children naturally. And my biggest, my son was almost 11 pounds. She did it all natural. And so those were tough. And I was there for all three of them. They were tough, but this one was worse. This one was harder. Even though Elizabeth was the smallest, she was eight pounds, eight ounces. She was the smallest of my kids. Um, this one was so much harder. It was so much harder on my wife. The, experience, the, the labor was so much longer. It was so much more difficult. Um, if we hadn't had Leah Peacock there, she was our midwife. She's, her husband works on our staff. If she hadn't been there with us, man, I don't know where we would be. It would have just been exponentially worse. Thank you so much, Leah. You're amazing. We love you. Um, but this one was hard. And at the end, I was exhausted in a way. I haven't been exhausted in a long time. I, I didn't get sleep for a couple of days. I mean, it was just, it was just brutal and it was tough. But then the, 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 the next morning when I was in the hospital, I woke up um, from my 15-minute power nap in between all the nurses coming in and doing their checks and all this kind of stuff. I woke up and this verse from Lamentations chapter 3, it just exploded in my heart. It just exploded in my life. It was just in, in a way that I hadn't noticed before. And I was just, I woke up and I was like, oh my goodness. I, his mercies really are new every morning. Thank you, Lord. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you so much. And it just, it, man, it grabbed me and it grabbed my heart. And as I was thinking through it and as I looked back and as I was studying and learning about the prophet Jeremiah who wrote Lamentations and what he had experienced, it, it's like God kind of put the pieces together in my brain in a, in a unique way. And he said, listen, sometimes in your life when you go through difficult things, when you go through tough things, when you go through exhausting things. Jeremiah, had, he went through all kinds of stuff. The temple was destroyed. His life was crazy and it was tough. He said, you know, in those moments when you come through it on the other side, or sometimes even when you're in the midst of those challenges, that's when God's grace shows up most. That's when you get to experience God's grace and his mercy in a powerful way, maybe that you've never experienced before. That's, that's what happened to me. Uh, you know, my, I experienced God's grace and I was, this verse came flooding back to me in a way that it had never had before because of the experiences that I just had, because of this moment, because of this difficulty, because of the exhaustion, God's grace was made new. His mercies were new that morning in a way I hadn't experienced in a long time. When we get to Jonah today, As we open the book of Jonah together, in Jonah chapter 2, we see Jonah experiencing this. We see Jonah coming to the end of himself, going through brutal circumstances, going through difficult things. He's at rock bottom, about as far down as you can go. And in the midst of that, Jonah finally begins, finally begins to truly understand God's grace. Let's read this together. Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Let's, let's, let's read this together. Here we go. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. Now remember, this is Jonah's just been swallowed by a great fish. Okay, so Jonah chapter 1, he goes through this storm. The sailors throw him over the boat. Hopefully you've joined us for this series along this way. You, you've, re- you've been with us through that part. He's just been swallowed by the great fish. And three days and three nights, he's in the belly of this fish. And at the end of those three days, he prays this prayer. He said, verse 2, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight. 
yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me up, you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. So Jonah, as we just read, he's at, he's at the bottom. He's at rock bottom. I mean, you look at some of the language. He talks about weeds being wrapped around his head. He's at the base of the mountain. He's underwater in the belly of a fish for three days. I mean, I can't even imagine what that smelled like or what that felt like. And that's Jonah. He's at the end. He's at the end of himself. And he finally begins to get it. He finally begins to understand God's grace. And all along, he's missed it. He should have known. He should have understood. All along, he's missed God's grace. We've talked about this together. We've talked about how God was gracious and, and wanted the people of Assyria, the Ninevites, he wanted them to come to repentance and, and ultimately, hopefully, faith in the Lord. And Jonah wanted nothing to do with it. He didn't want them to experience grace. Jonah goes into the ship and, and God's with him in the midst of that. He sends a storm to get his attention, not to punish him, but to grab a hold of his heart. And Jonah ignores it. He misses God's grace. He misses God's grace showing up in those sailors who were pagans. They didn't know anything about God. They didn't know anything about the Bible and the Old Testament, but they were good and kind and gracious, and they, they even threw cargo overboard to save Jonah's life. Jonah missed it. And as, as he gets, he's getting thrown into the ocean, into the sea, God sends, and you go back to look at verse 17, it says, God sent the fish. It wasn't random. It wasn't act. God sends this fish to swallow him. Jonah missed that too. It took him three days in the belly of the fish to finally understand God's grace and to begin to see for it, to begin to, to break through to him. And, and he, because he had this problem. He had this very dim, shallow view of what grace really is. And you know what? I think for a lot of us, especially those of us who've been in church a long time, I think a lot of us have a similar view of what grace really is. Now, we may know the textbook definition of grace. It's unmerited favor. Um, God's rewards at Christ's expense. Like we, we even have acronyms for it. Like we get that, like we can explain it intellectually. But I think a lot of us, we, we miss the power of what grace really is. We chalk it off to you know, some random circumstances. Wow, you know what? I would have been in that accident except for God's grace. You know, I, something told me to go get a peach milkshake at Chick-fil-A and I missed the accident. Wow, God's grace. Like that's our view of what grace really is, but, but we miss it. We miss understanding what it really is. And sometimes we have to get to rock bottom before we really grab a hold of it. J.I. Packer who wrote this incredible book called Knowing God, one of the best books on faith and Christianity and the Bible you'll ever read. If you've never read Knowing God by J.R. Packer, man, you need to go get a copy of that book and you need to read it. It's powerful. It's amazing. But he said this about grace. He said, many people talk about grace, but it is an abstraction to them, not a life-changing power. And I think this is true for a lot of us. It was definitely true for Jonah, but I think this is real for us too. For a lot of us, we, it's, grace is not a life-changing power. I mean, we sing about it. We love that song, Amazing Grace. Like, we know all 58 versions. We even know the Gilligan's Island version. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Like, and some of you now, I've lost you because that's all you're going to do is sing Amazing Grace to Gilligan's Island. Unless you're under 35 and you have no idea what Gilligan's Island is. So I, I don't know what to do with that. But maybe you'll Google it. I don't know. But, but a lot of us, I mean, that's, that's it. We got a definition, we got a song, we've got some experiential stuff, but, but it's not this life-changing, transformative understanding of what grace really is. Packer goes on to say in his book, you've got to get, the, the, to really understand grace, there's these three truths, these three grace truths you need to grab a hold of if you're really going to get to it, and Jonah does. Jonah gets it. Jonah sees it and fully, finally begins to understand grace. He sees this first grace, grace truth, what Packer calls the moral desert. The moral desert. Jonah, he, he begins to understand this truth. He comes to grip with, grips with this concept that he's a sinner, that we're all sinners, that we live in this moral desert, that we are not good people. 
at the core, we're not good people. And this is tough. This is so tough in our culture. You know, our, our world reads things like Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 10, it says this, No one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. You know, we hear that in our culture, in our day and age, in 2020, and we push back hard. Our, our culture doesn't help us with this, understanding this grace truth, number one, that we live in a moral desert, that we're not actually good people. We, we, we really aren't. We're sinners, every single one of us. And we've brought, this, we've brought this on ourselves. We can't blame anybody else. We can't blame our upbringing or our parents. We can't even blame Adam and Eve. We choose this for ourselves. And Packer says, if you don't get this one first, it's really hard to understand grace. You know, our culture tells us that our real problem is not sin. Our real problem is not a, a failure to understand it. Our real problem is that we, we know it too well. We experience too much guilt. We have too low of self-esteem. And so our culture tries to pump us up in what we call the triumph of, triumph of the therapeutic. Our culture tries to build our self-esteem and tell us, no, 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 you're actually really good. You're actually really good if you just have the right experiences and the right opportunities. If it wasn't for your parents messing you up, messing you up if it wasn't for your lack of income, if it wasn't for this or this or this, you'd be a good person. And so that we get fed that over and over and over again, it just gets pumped into us. And so it's really hard for us to understand that we really live in a moral desert. And as Romans says, we're really no good. We're, none of us are any good. No, not one of us. And that's tough. Because we like to think the opposite. And, when, and whenever we get caught in that trap, we miss what grace really is. And Jonah sees it, though. He sees it. He looks at verse 3. Look back at Jonah chapter 2, verse 3. He says this, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and this flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. He understands for the first time. He finally gets that, you know what? Even though he's a Hebrew, even though he's a prophet, even though he's from this chosen priesthood, this royal nation, this, this holy group of people that God had set aside hundreds of years ago, he finally comes to the grip. He says, you know what? But I've messed up. I've done this. It's not anybody else's fault. It's me. And God punished me for it. He said, you, Lord, cast me into the deep. Not those sailors. You, Lord. And that's on me. And he finally begins to get this grace truth that we have to come to as well. That we really are sinners. That we really are sinners in need of salvation. We've separated ourselves from God by our own choice. We did that. Right? That's where we are. That's who we are. And Jonah gets it. We need to get it. Jonah sees a second grace truth. Grace truth number two, what Packer calls spiritual impotence. Spiritual impotence. This idea that we can't save ourselves. We've sinned. We've separated ourselves from God, and we can't fix the problem. If we really want grace to be this life-changing truth, we got to get this too. That while we're separated from God because of our sins, there's nothing we can do to repair that, that, that separation. There's nothing we can do to fix that. And again, this is something that our culture bristles at, rails against. Maybe even you, you're watching this and you're like, man, Jay, I don't like that. I don't like what you're saying right now. I, I really don't appreciate this. I'm not a sinner and you know what? I, I, I'm a good person and, and I work hard and I pray the right prayers. Man, Jay, I'm like you. I read my Bible all the time. Surely that's worth something. The Bible would say otherwise. We have to understand that it's not about us working our way back into God's good graces. There's nothing we can do. The Bible says grace is a gift. It's not because of our works. Ephesians chapter 2 says that it's not about our works. There's nothing we can do. We're spiritually impotent except for the grace of God and the mercy of God, the love of God. Man, we're, we're left out in the cold. Jonah finally sees this. Verse 5. Verse 5 and 6 says, The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountain. I'm in this place and there's nothing I can do to get out of it. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. And it's the understanding. Okay, he finally gets, he's in this desert and he needs out. And he's, 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 there's, no, there's no way for him to, to be saved. And then he says this at the end of verse 6. Yet you. And, and if you've got a paper Bible, I would really encourage you, underline those two words. Yet you. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. Yet 
you, God. He recognizes that there's no way out of this, this place on his own. He, he, he can't do enough. He can't be good enough. He's in the belly of a fish. He, he can't say, okay, well, I'll go do this, and I'll go preach that, and I'll go serve there, and I'll go tie this, and I'll go do all these things. He's, he, 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 he's, he's past that. He's past that point. He says, okay, God, you and you alone can save me. It's not about my family background. It's not about the church I go to. It's not about how many times I serve in the nursery. It's not about any of those things. It's about you, God. Without you, Lord, I'm lost. The weeds are wrapped around my head. I'm at the base of the mountain. Without you, God, there's nothing I can do. For grace to really resonate in our life, for it to be this life-changing, transformative power, not only do we have to recognize we're sinners in need of salvation, we have to recognize that only God can save us. Only God can bring salvation, not us. That's grace truth number two. And then Jonah, he recognizes grace truth number three. Grace truth number three is that there's a cost to this salvation, a tremendous cost to this salvation. In verse four, of Jonah chapter two, verse four, he, 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 there's this little phrase that's kind of embedded in there, and it shows up again in verse 7. Look at verse 4. It says, Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. There's that phrase, holy temple. You can underline those two words, holy temple, in, your, in, in the text. He says that in verse 7 at the very end. He says, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Shows up again. And this is just a little Bible interpretation 101. If a phrase, a specific phrase shows up more than once in a passage or in a, in a section of the Bible, that's a big deal. That's a clue that this is an important concept, right? And so this shows up, this phrase, holy temple shows up twice. And there's a reason that Jonah is talking about God's holy temple, right? And so the holy temple was special. It was unique. It was specific, and not just the complex itself. It wasn't about the courts and it wasn't about all those things, although those were great and they were part of the temple complex. What Jonah's talking about is this very specific place in the holy temple. It's in the place where the Ark of the Covenant dwelt, in the Holy of Holies. And specifically, he's talking about the cover over the Ark of the Covenant, what the Bible calls the mercy seat. It calls the mercy seat. And it's this, this basically there's this solid gold cover with two angels on top of it, and their wings are pointed together. If you've seen Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know what it looks like. And so the, the, this is called the mercy seat. And what God said is that this is where he dwelt. This specifically in this place was where he dwelt, and this is where he would communicate to his people. This is where he would have conversation, where he would talk to his people, was at the mercy seat, was in this one little specific place. And Jonah's crying out. And saying, hey, in that place, I remembered that. And see, here, here's the thing. The mercy seat could only be approached one time a year. And only by one specific person. The high priest alone could go into the Holy of Holies. And he could go and meet God at that place on the mercy seat. But because of his sin, because he was a sinner... And because he was spiritually impotent, there was nothing he could do to save himself. It wasn't about his good works. Even though he was the high priest, they had to sacrifice an animal. They had to sacrifice a lamb on, on behalf of the, the high priest's sin and the rest of the people's sin. They had to make this sacrifice. And then the high priest would go in there and he would sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the mercy seat. And then and only then, after his sins had been paid for and after they had been atoned for, then and only then could he meet and talk to God face to face. There was an incredible price that had to be paid because of the sin. And Jonah alludes to this and he grabs a hold of this and he says, listen, I get it. I'm a sinner. God, I need your help. And I'm looking to you. I'm looking to you to, to make restitution, to atone for my sins so that I can meet you face to face. And now Jonah couldn't have understood this at the time. And nobody else in the time could have understood this. But now we can look back and we can see that this is the ultimate picture in the Old Testament of the sacrifice of Jesus. See, in this temple worship, in this, this concept of the mercy seat, it, it established all three truths about grace, that we're sinners, we're separated from God, 
that we're spiritually impotent, that we can't, by our own good works, approach God's throne of grace and his mercy. That something has to take our place. Something has to atone for our sin. An incredible price has to be paid. A sacrifice must be made for us to speak to God face to face. And centuries after Jonah, a man shows up. He's he's born in this little town called Bethlehem. And he grows up. His name is Jesus. And he preaches for three years and he gathers people around him. And then at the end of his life, at the end of his three years of ministry, he goes to a cross and he sacrifices himself on our behalf and he atones for our sin. It's just like what we talked about last week and about atonement. Jesus' sacrifice paid for us. It sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat so that we could stand face to face with God. And until we get those three truths, until we truly understand the cost, until we truly understand how far from God we really are because of our sin, until we truly come to grips with the fact that we are sinners, grace becomes a byword, becomes a song. A great song, but just a song. And so here today you may be in this place where you're wondering, okay, what does this mean for you? What does this mean for you? What does this mean in your life? Like, what, is, what, is this, what does this mean for you? Well, if you've never understood grace for the first time, if you've never come to a place where you've really gotten it, where you've never said yes to Jesus, man, I, I want to encourage you to pray. I want to encourage you to think. And I encourage you to come to, to grips and to wrestle through these three truths. Wrestle through these three concepts of what grace really is. That you're a sinner, separated from God. That you and you're on your own, you, you can't fix that problem. You're not uh, good enough to get into heaven. You're not good enough to stand before God's throne on your own. You need help. You need God to fix the problem. And an incredible price was paid for that fix. An incredible price was paid for you through the sacrifice of Jesus. I want you to think about that today and pray about that if you've never given your life to Christ for the first time. Maybe, though, you've done that. You've accepted Jesus. He's your Lord and Savior. You've been immersed. You've gone, you've gone to church. You're, you're a Christian. You call yourself a Christian. But maybe you're more like Jonah, and you've used the word grace, and you thought you understood grace, but maybe it's kind of gotten fuzzy. It's gotten squishy around the edges because you've forgotten that you're a sinner. Or maybe you've gotten to this place where you don't think you really are. You're not as bad as so-and-so. You didn't have the story that that person did. And you're, you're basically a good person. I want you to encourage you. You need to think through those three truths as well. You need to come back and re-understand and come to grips again with your sin. Come to grips again with your, your inability to make up for your sin. Come to grips again with the price that was paid for you on that cross. Come to grips with what grace really is so that it can be this transformative power in your life. Or maybe you got it. You get it. You understand it. Like you're cognizant and you're aware. It's more than just a song. It's more than just a catchphrase. It's more than just a word that's on a picture on your wall or something. Like you really get it. You really understand and you're living it. And you're actively, grace is transforming you all the time. If you're in that place, then today I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you. Who is it that you need to share this truth with? Who do you need to share the gospel with? Who do you you need to talk to about God's grace? Because you get it. You've got it. You understand it. You can't hold it. You got to go tell somebody. You got to go talk to some people. You got to talk to those family members as hard as it may be. You got to talk to those coworkers as difficult of a challenge as that is. Maybe that's God's call to you today. Because you understand. Maybe he's even put a name before you or a face before you and said, hey, here's the person that needs to understand my grace like you did. Maybe that's your challenge. I don't know whatever it is God's saying to you right now. 
I don't know what he's speaking into you and speaking into your heart, but I want you to spend some time thinking about it. I want you to think about it here for a few moments. We're going to spend some time in communion here in just a second. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to encourage you to take communion, take the elements of communion. Remember the price that was paid for you. Remember what it cost to atone for your sacrifice. Remember that you were spiritually impotent apart from Christ. Remember that you were a sinner outside of God's grace and his goodness because you're not that good. Right? Remember those things as you take communion right now. And then listen to what God has to say to you, whether it's to accept him for the first time or come back to him and rededicate and recommit to him or to go share your faith with someone else. Whatever it is, listen to what God has to say. Let me pray for us, and then we'll take communion. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that you will speak to us now, that you will speak to every single person, every single man, woman, and child who's watching and listening to this. God, as they take communion, as they gather around your table and they remember practically, tangibly, physically, the sacrifice and the cost, the price that Jesus paid on that cross, God, would you speak into hearts? God, we don't want grace to just be a buzzword or to be a, 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 a lyric to a song. God, it needs to transform us. It needs to shape us. It needs to mold us. It needs to be the air that we breathe, the fuel in the tank for us as Christians. God, would you speak into our hearts and help us to see what we need to do with this today? Very practically, what do we need to do? How do we need to live? God, would you speak that to us now? We love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I don't know how God just spoke to you through our time of communion. I don't know what he said to you, but I, I, I know that he's been speaking. I know he's challenging you. He's encouraging you. Maybe you're in that place where, as we talked about just a few moments ago, maybe you've come to face to face with what grace really is for the very first time. And you've come to this place. You say, wow. I, I never knew that before. I never understood that I was a sinner. I never understood the price that Jesus paid for me. Well, I need to talk to somebody about what this means. If you're in that place, shoot me an email. Give me a call. Reach out to somebody. If you don't want to talk to me, that's okay. Doesn't, doesn't hurt my heart. Um, grab one of our other staff members. Reach out to a friend, somebody you know that walks with Jesus and loves the Lord. Talk to somebody today. Don't go away from today and say, well, I'll get back to that. Maybe you're in a place where you've accepted Christ, you've been immersed, you, you've gone through those steps, but maybe you kind of lost the, the power of grace in your life. And maybe you're in this place like we talked about where you need to rededicate or you need to refocus, you need to come back to what you once knew. 
If you're in that place, reach out. Reach out, call somebody, talk to somebody, take a step, do something. Or maybe you just need to share your faith. Maybe there's somebody you need to share the story of grace with. Man, write that down. Pick up the phone today. Don't wait, because we all know how life works, right? You'll have this intention, this idea, okay, I'm going to do this, and then it gets lost because life gets in the way. Don't let that happen to you today. I really encourage you to take that step. As we wrap up, I just want to remind you again about giving online. nwcc.net slash give. We really appreciate your generosity and, and we really encourage you to, to support this ministry as we continue to see God move in our community through your gifts and through your, through your giving and through your service. If you ever think, man, I'm ready to, to get away from the online and get to the face-to-face, I want to let you know that throughout the month of August, we're going to have worship on our property face-to-face Sunday morning at 1030. We have one service in our building at 1030 in the morning, but we're also doing worship outside. So we're having church on the lawn for the month of August in the evening, every Sunday evening at 730, from 730 to 830. If you say, hey, I'm ready for that. I'm ready to take that step. This online thing has been amazing, but I'm ready to see people and do face-to-face. We'd love to have you show up for one of those services as well. Uh, it's just like our online services. We do the same songs, do the same message. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It's great to see people. I hope to see you there. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you all. Have an amazing week. Thank you.